The Bible is explicit that the final days will be marked by unprecedented deception, a scale of which the world has never seen. In these times, we must be vigilant, discerning, and deeply rooted in the truth of God's word. We live in an era where trust in mainstream news outlets is waning, and more people are awakening to the realization that the only unfaltering truth is found in the Holy Bible. Yet, deception is not confined to the world outside the church. It infiltrates our places of worship and even our hearts. Before we focus on deception within the church, it is crucial to address those who are self-deceived, for the Bible speaks extensively about this peril. The Bible warns us repeatedly about the deception that will characterize the last days. In Matthew 24, verse 4 to 5, Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. This warning emphasizes the prevalence and severity of deception in the end times. Paul echoes this sentiment in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he speaks of the lawless one whose coming will be marked by all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. This deception will be so strong that it will lead many away from the truth. We see the manifestations of these warnings in our time, the rise of false prophets, the spread of misinformation, and the growing distrust in traditional institutions all point to a world teetering on the brink of profound deception. People are increasingly skeptical of mainstream media and are turning to alternative sources. Before we delve into the deception within the church, it is imperative to focus on the danger of self-deception, which the Bible addresses with great urgency. In Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23, Jesus delivers a chilling warning. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This passage is not a hypothetical scenario. It is a real event that will occur involving real people with real eternal destinies at stake. It is a stark warning from Jesus himself about the potential for self-deception in matters of eternal significance. Imagine standing before Jesus, the one you have professed to follow, whose name you have called upon in your prayers, whose teachings you have perhaps even preached. You are confident in your salvation because you have prophesied in his name, cast out demons in his name, and performed many wonders in his name. You have preached great sermons and brought people to Christ, but then you hear the most chilling words imaginable. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. These words should send a shiver down our spines. They underscore the difference between outward religious activity and genuine obedient faith. Jesus is not impressed by our ability to perform religious tasks or our public displays of piety. What he seeks is a heart that truly knows him and is aligned with his will. Paul urges us in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. This passage clearly indicates that there will be individuals who believe they are serving Christ and are saved, yet they will be rejected by him. This passage should lead us to a profound moment of self-examination. We must ask ourselves, are we truly living out the will of the Father, or are we merely going through the motions of religious activity? Do we know Jesus intimately, and does he know us? Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is how God measures our love for him, through our obedience. Loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves is the essence of doing the will of the Father. Genuine faith is not just about believing in Jesus. It is about following him and obeying his commands. It is about aligning our lives with his purposes and living out his teachings in every aspect of our lives. It means surrendering our will to His and allowing Him to transform us from the inside out. The Bible teaches about a very real spirit world. To deny the reality of the spirit world is to deny the very Bible. To deny the reality of the spirit world is to reject the instructions of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, 
against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is evil present in the world. Take a look at the world around you, and it is evident that there is a real evil force influencing this world we live in. Why else would people in this generation call good evil and evil good? Why else would they celebrate behaviors that God hates? Why else does it seem like people have lost their general common sense? Evil is present. Satan, the fallen one, is described as the god of this world, and he is influencing the minds of the people of this world. Do not be a naive Christian. Look at how the world is unfolding, and you can clearly see a malevolent spirit in this world. If there's one group of people who should understand the spirit world, it's Christians. There are two basic types of demonic spirits that repeatedly show up in the New Testament. One is unclean spirits, and the other is demons. Now let's look at these terms individually. 1. Unclean spirit. In the New Testament, the term unclean spirit is derived from the Greek words akathartos. It means unclean in a ceremonial, moral, or spiritual sense. This word is often used to describe things that are impure or not fitting for God's presence. Pneuma. This word can mean spirit, wind, or breath. In the context of unclean spirit, it refers to a spiritual entity or being. When the two words are combined in the New Testament, as in akathartos pneuma, they are typically translated into English as unclean spirit. This term often refers to demonic spirits or entities that are contrary to God and His purity. The term unclean spirit appears over 16 times in the New Testament Bible. 2. Demons or devils In the New Testament, the term translated as devils in some English versions actually stems from two primary Greek words, diabolos. This word is typically translated as devil in many English Bibles. It is where we get the term diabolical in English. Diabolos means slanderer or accuser. In the New Testament, it often refers specifically to Satan, the adversary. Daimonion. This word is often translated as demons in many modern English versions of the Bible. Daimonion refers to lesser evil spirits or supernatural beings subordinate to Satan. When the New Testament refers to individuals who are demon-possessed or have an unclean spirit, it is this term that's typically used. While diabolos is usually singular in reference to Satan, daimonion is the term most commonly used in the context of demonic possessions in the New Testament. Daimonion appears over 60 times in the New Testament. So, within the New Testament, there is a distinction between the usage of unclean spirit on one hand and demon on the other. These beings are real. In both the Old and New Testaments, we see how these entities have a tangible effect on this world. I have conducted extensive research and study in demonology, and I cannot find a single verse in the Bible indicating that these beings have ceased their operations in this world. Not one verse suggests this. On the contrary, my Bible indicates that in the last days, there will be an increase in demonic and evil spirit activity. 1 Timothy 4, 1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the earth, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Yet, if you were to attend the modern church, you might believe that demons no longer exist. The Bible never said this. The Bible never avoids this topic. Yet modern churches and modern preachers avoid this topic. Indeed, they will preach to you about getting a breakthrough, about getting rich, and about your dreams coming true. However, they will avoid the topic of demons. When there are people living in this world who face unclean spirits and devils every single day of their lives. I spoke to one lady who was under demonic attack. She attended her local church and spoke to the pastor, explaining how she was tormented by an evil spirit. She described how she would literally see objects moving in her home without any human intervention. She mentioned how doors would slam open in her house when no one was around. 
On some occasions, she felt physically pushed by an unseen force when alone in her house. At times, while sleeping, she would be pulled out of her bed. She consistently felt an ominous presence and the sensation of being watched. Instead of assisting this woman, the pastor turned her away. Can you imagine? A woman oppressed by demonic forces went to a church seeking help and was turned away. That very day, she purchased a Bible and began reading it aloud. The ominous presence she felt started to wane. Over time, the demonic manifestations she experienced became less frequent. Her deliverance from this evil spirit was not immediate. It was a process. And do you know what brought her relief? Just reading the Bible and coming to know Jesus. All the paranormal and demonic events in her life eventually ceased. This underscores an essential point about evil spirits. They do not fear you, your knowledge, or your resources. Remember, these are spirits that have been around far longer than any of us. They don't fear us. They fear Jesus. They fear God Almighty. James 2, 19 Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. We live in an age where the world is saturated with unclean spirits. Allow me to divert for a moment to discuss demonic possession. Demonic possession did not end with the Bible. It continues today. Much of the lawlessness, wickedness, and evil we witness in our world can be attributed to demonic possession. We live in an age saturated with devils and spirit beings. Our world is full of unclean evil spirits. There are multitudes of them, an untold number. They invade people's lives. They are everywhere on earth, an untold number of them. They are in people's lives. They are all across the face of the earth. They've already come, but people don't see it. People are tormented by them in their homes, too, afraid to share their experiences. These individuals see shadowy figures, hear unexplained footsteps, endure nightmares, and are even fearful of sleeping in the homes they own. I could recount more tales of people's encounters with evil spirits, but that's not the focal point of my sermon. The core message is clear. Turn to Jesus. If you are experiencing demonic attack, turn to Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is victory in the name of Jesus. There is salvation in the name of Jesus. There is hope and wholeness in the name of Jesus. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. There is authority in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is peace in the name of Jesus. There is redemption in the name of Jesus. There is refuge in the name of Jesus. There is light in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is strength in the name of Jesus. There is grace in the name of Jesus. There is eternal life in the name of Jesus. There is sanctification in the name of Jesus. There is mercy in the name of Jesus. There is love in the name of Jesus. There is protection in the name of Jesus. There is restoration in the name of Jesus. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved, except the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. For Christians, we do not have to live in fear. Colossians 2, 15 And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Consider the image painted in Colossians 2.15. It doesn't talk about a passive Christ who merely overcomes these powers. It describes a triumphant Christ who has disarmed the powers and authorities, making an open and public spectacle of them. Imagine a victorious warrior parading defeated enemies for all to see, signaling a clear, unambiguous triumph this is the image of Christ's victory over these spirits. A victory so absolute that it's akin to a public decoration for all to witness. But there's more. Not only are these entities defeated, but they also fear Jesus Christ. 
The omnipotent divine power of Christ is so immense that even these spirits tremble at His name. This profound reverence they have for Christ offers believers an added layer of assurance. It means that whenever a Christian says the name of Jesus, it's not just a call for help. It's a battle cry that resonates with victory and authority. As James 4, 7 advises, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This isn't merely a suggestion. It's a divine strategy rooted in the very nature of Christ's triumph. Although we live in an age saturated with devils and evil spirit beings, although we live in a world that is full of unclean evil spirits, there are multitudes of them, an untold number. We do not need to fear. Why? One verse. One single verse. 1 John 4, 4 Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In essence, the divine Spirit of Christ dwelling in every believer is infinitely more powerful than any eternal force, demonic or otherwise. Christians, therefore, are not mere bystanders in this spiritual war. They are empowered soldiers, armored with the might of Christ. In conclusion, while the presence of demons and unclean spirits is a reality, Christians have a greater reality to live in, Jesus Christ's unparalleled power and victory. So let every believer stand tall, unshaken, and resolute, knowing that in Christ they have nothing, absolutely nothing to fear. So let every believer stand tall, unshaken, and resolute, knowing that in Christ they have nothing, absolutely nothing to fear. So let every believer stand tall, unshaken and resolute, knowing that in Christ they have nothing, absolutely nothing to fear.